listening to 88.1 FM WVYC, the voice of your college, and you just heard Tom Sawyer from Rush. Good afternoon, everyone, and this is the voice of your college. Thanks for tuning in this Friday, September 28th to my show. My name is Keelan Tollinger, and I'll be with you for the next hour with a variety of music and stories. I always seem to jump into my shows talking about bad weather, so I'm going to do it again, but this time with a little bit of a lighter tone. Hurricane Florence again. We've had the storm, families are returning home, taking stock of the damage, and you might be one of the many who have donated either some of your money or your goods to the victims out in the Carolinas. We need to talk about Florence Wisniewski instead. Now, so do you often like start paying attention whenever you hear your name in someone else's conversation or on the TV? I'm asking you because with my name, nobody ever really says it. I have no idea what it means to share a name with someone or something. But the Florence we're talking about is a four-year-old who started hearing her name on every news broadcast recently, um, in the mouths of her friends and her neighbors, and that got her thinking and she didn't really know why. The story from CNN goes that her mother, uh, Tricia, explained to her daughter that this storm that shared her name was a bit of an unfortunate thing. Uh, The pictures of, for instance, um, the flooded neighborhoods, Um, A family with an infant sleeping inside of a high school hallway, um, a boat sitting in someone's yard. Younger Florence, I'll start calling her Flo from now on, thought that the no-brainer thing to do upon seeing this stuff was to send help to those affected, like that misplaced family, things like diapers and toys. This family lives hundreds of miles away in Chicago, though, but they decided they wanted to start a little donation drive. Flo asked her neighbors for donations in a red wagon. Her father took a large cardboard box to her school, and that filled up with things. But apparently it was a single Facebook post about what Flo was doing that eventually made this motion get out of hand in a good way. The local news picked up this story. Then the Wisniewski family was getting donations from around the United States. They had filled their two-car garage with donations, and more of them kept trickling in. So they paired up with a nonprofit in Ohio named Matthew 25 Ministries to create a shipment that wind up in the Carolinas. An entire semi-truck full of supplies is the result of this little donation drive. And I guess it's owed in part to having a four-year-old, she actually just turned five the other day, who shared the hurricane's name and just brought out so much goodwill in people. The picture of her sitting in this throne made of diaper packages and all these other goods surrounding her is just a pretty awesome story. It's not every day that you know someone with an uncommon name and get that somewhat unfortunate coincidence that for a few weeks, everybody is going to be talking about you. If you can turn it around into something beneficial, that's more power to you in your hands. And I also still won't have any idea what that's like since I might never see a major hurricane go all the way down to the K's and then select my name. But anyway, we have some more topics to cover for this show. If you live in the bigger cities, you might be well acquainted with electric scooter sharing. I'll share some news on that in a little bit. Tiger Woods, everyone's most recognizable golfer, had a recent upswing. The big game is also set, Penn State versus Ohio State, and some important things in each university season are at stake. And a little research I discovered about mindsets, what the words fix and growth can mean when it comes to early learning. All that and a little more once we kick off the hour with some music. I discovered an artist over the summer named Hazel English. She's from Australia and has a pretty underground following in the music world. A very dreamy, swirly style of instrumentals. She's touring in the United States right now and apparently gearing up for a release of a new album in the coming future. She also released her first project just last year. Now, since I follow her on Facebook, I was able to answer a question she posed to her couple thousand worldwide fans on what their favorite song from her was. I said it's this one, titled Other Lives. Hazel English is here on 88.1 FM, and I will be back in three minutes. Welcome back, Hazel English with Other Lives here on 88.1 FM, WVYC. So a little tidbit about that Facebook post I said I made to Hazel English's page. The neat thing about these smaller artists is that they like to go through and actually read their comments. Since so many of them are genuine fans, they aren't trolls, Hazel happened to like that I loved Other Lives, and also the dozen of other answers up and down the list of respondents, but it was just cool to be a little bit acknowledged. Anyway, I went shopping at a local mall last weekend for clothes to wear during my broadcast performance class. And on the way back to campus, I had to stop at a green light for a parade. 
More specifically, it was a motorcycle rally of some kind. I don't know if it was for any particular individual or group, if it was military sponsored, but they must have had every single rider in the York area passing through this intersection. Because even though I was just about right in the middle of it when my car was stopped, I sat there for maybe 150 to 200 motorcycles, making this left turn from South George Street to Country Club Road in front of the college's entrance. I tried asking around to figure out what this event was for later, but the whole point of that incident to me was that half or so of the men or women riding their bikes weren't wearing helmets. And you know, it's their choice to live how they want to live, they're wild and free spirits, and Pennsylvania law doesn't require anyone over the age of 21 to wear them. I think it's a good idea as far as safety goes, I mean, that's a bit of a no-brainer. But there's plenty of arguments against requiring them, I guess, as well as personal choices that I'd hear if I asked a rider. Where seeing that whole parade of helmetless bikers hit me was while browsing my social media feed the other day. Now, two of my Facebook friends shared a pair of local news articles from where they live that I think were really substantial. I'll start with the one written on September 20th by Sacramento, California TV station which reported that State Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill removing a mandate that required adult electric scooter riders to wear a helmet. What is an adult electric scooter, first of all? It's exactly what you'd picture a kid to be riding around on through the neighborhood, pushing it with their feet, but the electric part is that they're motorized, and can basically wield themselves like a Segway or a motorcycle. Why an adult would be riding one is the second half of this whole story, it was just this summer, I think, that electric scooter sharing took off in many, many major cities throughout the United States. It's just like renting a bike at the shore, for instance, except it's the morning commute people are handling and stuff. Tourists might use these scooters to see the sights. What a lot of these scooters operate on is sort of like the premise of Uber and Lyft ride sharing. Now, these companies behind them are really interesting in itself. As said, from spring to summer of this year is when businesses such as Lime, Bird, and Spin really took off. They established themselves in the trendier, cutting-edge cities with loads of young people, Seattle and San Francisco, the two biggest candidates. And the reason for them starting up was trying to make a cure for mass transit backups, traffic, reducing pollution. Overall, convenience was at the head of this idea. And they made millions. A bird had $115 million in investments just in April 2018. Lime with $132 million, and each had maybe 30,000 to 40,000 scooters placed around a couple major cities. The principle behind most of this movement is to scan and go. Each of the scooters has a QR code, like a barcode symbol, that you use your phone's camera to capture. Then it can give you a map to see where you can dock the scooters when you're finished, and for the most part, it's kind of the trust system, where you can leave your scooter anywhere for someone else to come along, scan the code, and start riding it to their destination. They only go about 10 to 15 miles per hour, so they're mostly made for sidewalks. But you can still imagine how it might be dangerous to ride these in big cities, especially when you're not required to wear a helmet for them. I mean, the, the companies themselves recommend it. The city of San Francisco, which was kind of the springboard for this whole industry, actually outright banned these scooters a short while ago because they couldn't get these companies to comply with every law. And yet another article was published in the Washington, D.C. area, September 21st, the very next day, of a 20-year-old man who was killed after being pinned under a car. His belongings at the scene included a shoe, a pair of headphones, and a Lime rental scooter. This was believed to be the second confirmed death from an electric scooter, of sharing a trend that follows an, an increase in hospital visits uh, around the country from motorized small vehicle injuries. You might see more of these incidents make the news in the future because more and more of these rental programs are finding smaller cities to establish themselves. They fight with city officials sometimes to get riders to wear helmets, to follow transportation laws, generally not be an idiot, <laughs> but the only certification you need to ride these things is generally agreeing to a smartphone app's list of rules. And we all know how thoroughly people at our age read the fine print, the terms and conditions. Uh, so that gets us to actually about 3.15 here in the studio. I'm going to take a short break and talk about the weather here at York, Pennsylvania. So, now York College is actually starting to get in on the sharing equipment trend as well. 
Outside of the Grumbacher Sports Complex on West Campus is a new rack of bicycles, all identically white. They belong to a company called B-Cycle, I think. There's a system in place where you can download an app on a smartphone from them, likely log in with a username and password, maybe store a credit card so they can charge you money for rental fees, and technology on the bike itself like a GPS to track mileage. Now I didn't see a helmet supplied to renters, which goes back to an earlier concern about safety, but these companies no doubt put the risk in the hands of the rider whenever they are operating their things. I mean, whatever happens to a York College student, I guarantee is not going to be the administration's fault. They'll argue against that. I feel like part of the service that wasn't very necessary since the distance between the campuses here is only a couple blocks. This isn't a sprawling university where it's incredibly tough to get from one place to another. If you don't want to, ro to uh, walk a mile or so from one extreme edge of the college to the other, uh, renting a bike may be smarter, maybe a more economic choice than maneuvering your car from place to place. I would just be concerned about how accustomed other people are to seeing bikes around here. In a world where we want convenience, quick commutes, freedom, not having to rely or pay for mass transit, these sorts of companies won't be going away. Now other cultures have been doing these sharing systems for years as well. Cities in Asia and Europe are famous for having these communal transportation systems of sometimes hundreds and hundreds of bikes parked outside of train stations or tourist destinations, and sometimes you can ride away with those for free. There is an honor system, a system of honesty that hopes you leave your bike in a place for someone else to come along and use it. It's like an umbrella being passed around on a rainy day, and it's the values of the people that keep it in motion and good repair. So is it maybe our downfall as Americans that we kind of rush around, sometimes carelessly, uncourteously go from place to place with our vehicles? In our cities, we have to deal with problems like increasingly distracted driving that makes so many problems for some riders. While I haven't seen many of the interactions with the scooter riders and pedestrians and drivers firsthand, I can totally understand that in the larger cities, like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, that there is a struggle going on as to whether this sort of system can stay. We haven't seen these effects come up in downtown York or something, at least I don't think. But every local government needs to weigh things like civilian safety, the litter, with scooters propped up against buildings or laying on the sidewalk. Despite all this, business will continue as usual, and only time will tell if more standards have to be put in place, like Uber had to, to refine its practices over the years. If you, for instance, feel confident enough in your abilities to handle riding a scooter nowadays, perhaps you'll think about using them in, for your commute, but at least make that investment in a helmet for your sake. That puts us at about 318 here at York College, so let's take a break and I will be back soon with more. For now, this is a bit of a blast from the past. It's ABBA with Lay All Your Love On Me. I'll be right back. That's about as 70 as it gets here on 88.1 FM WVYC. ABBA with Lay All Your Love On Me. My name is Keelan Tollinger and you're still with me for about half an hour or so. So uh, I'm going to get back into another uplifting story to hopefully make your day. You've probably already heard about it by now, but it's the comeback of a one Tiger Woods. This guy has been playing professional golf ever since I've been alive, practically. And being someone who tried the sport in and out as a kid, probably one of my childhood heroes. He's another unparalleled athlete when it comes to his sport. I talked a few weeks ago about Serena Williams, who's got over a, a dozen major, uh, two dozen major tournament wins or so, but Woods owns 80. And that's only if you count his PGA Tour wins here, but 80 trophies. There's 40 if you want to count European competitions in there. I think four Masters Championships, four PGA Championships, just 107 professional victories in total. Tiger Woods meant so much to a great uncle of mine, who watched golf religiously. Uncle Bud witnessed just about every single moment of Woods' rising career. I think my uncle especially just got a kick out of what young athletes across any sport were doing to break into the professional realm. And just the way that Woods took over golfing in the early 2000s, it had to be pretty magical to watch. He won everything, was number one in the world. Go look up the Tiger Woods' impossible chip shot at the 16th in the 2005 Masters, actually, if you haven't seen it on YouTube. The one shot where he hits it from the bunker to the middle of the green, but the way he planned it is that it rolled and rolled 20 feet downhill or so, as slow as it could, 
the ball stood on the lip of the cup for a solid two seconds, and, and then it finally dropped in. That was the, in your life have you seen anything like that, call from the commentator. And it was another year, Tiger won the Masters in the end. I remember sitting in my grandmother's living room when I was about 12 years old. I have no idea what the family gathering was that day. It was an August day in 2008. But Uncle Bud was visiting from his home, and of course the television was tuned to a golf tournament. I had to look, up, I had to look it up, but it was the Arnold Palmer Invitational. I'll just never forget the moment that Tiger was trying to finish off the 18th hole. He was in the lead, he just had to hold on with a par, I think, to get out of there with a one-stroke victory or something. If he won this event, it'd be his fifth straight PGA Tour win, um, his fifth win at this specific tournament, his 64th title overall. I felt kind of bad because Uncle Bud <laughs> got up and went to the kitchen before I got to see Tiger make the first attempt at this 24-foot putt. It looked long, it looked difficult, but yeah, I think Bud got himself a root beer in the kitchen and he didn't come back in time because Tiger sank a birdie instead of a par. I was just loud and amazed. Tiger was so ecstatic that he did his famous hat slam into the green and yelled. I mean, at least the replays let Bud see what happened, but that was my Tiger moment. That solidified his status as the best to me in my eyes. And he really changed the game in the sense of golf's publicity, its strategy. And part of the reason for his success is that he had a monster drive off the tee. Wasn't it like 300 yards plus on average, maybe more? They had to start lengthening holes in yardage because of how effective it was for golfers who learned to crush it and have easy second and third shots. His endorsements like Nike and Gatorade built his wealth. He became the highest paid golfer of all time. I love the one commercial he was in, uh, though he starred like so many others of him at the register for a grocery store, and when the cashier woman asks for cash or credit, he just smiles and puts up this giant board with a million dollars in the corner and says, check. I forget what company it was for, but they made a series of uh, golf video games using his namesake too, just like how uh, Madden Football is the virtual sport equivalent of America's game. A side note, I think I have Tiger Woods PGA Tour 2010? I think it would have been a nice gift for a player who couldn't often get back out on the course like Uncle Bud, who owned a Nintendo Wii like I did, but his choice was Wii Golf back when it was a therapeutic game. That was great for seniors. Anyway, Woods' red shirt and black pants when it was the final day of a tournament, his special club cover with a stuffed tiger, the way he was so intense and excitable meant that the sport of golf had its modern celebrity. It was all made for television. Now, we know every major athlete can't remain at the top forever. At some point, their careers are going to slow down, and they won't be the best for long. Tiger's career in 2009 just tanked, late when the scandals began to arise. His extramarital affairs just about ruined him. His sponsors were pulling away left and right. And just like, in the span of a week, he was taking an indefinite leave from professional golf. Divorce from his wife in 2010 kicked off a very rocky career for Woods from that point onward. It seemed like whenever he was playing, his mind was adrift. He was an average player, and he was also suffering from physical pain just by playing. He just kept pulling out of tournaments with elbow issues, leg issues, back spasms. The images of him leaning on his club, bent over, watching the ball fall onto the green, and instead of finishing the hole, he just went home. I remember, that, though, that like all this time, people wanted to see Woods recover. His enormous fan base still followed him, shouted his name as he staggered through these courses, and just looked so irritated at all of them. It's almost like he thought he didn't deserve their cheering. But you can't deny the lowest point of his career, and this was back in May of 2017, was when he was arrested for driving under the suspected influence of alcohol or drugs for falling asleep at the wheel in the middle of the road. Do you remember like the bags under his eyes, the 5 o'clock shadow in his mugshot, and did you honestly think that maybe his career was over by then? I thought so. I didn't. I wouldn't have been surprised by it. The surgery after surgery to try to get him back into the game didn't seem like it would have mattered. But March 2018, he placed his first top five finish since 2013. And last Saturday, Woods completed that elusive comeback. The 80th win at that last tournament of the season, the PGA Tour Championship. And it seems to be like it's only upwards from here for now. I've got to say that as much of a joy it would have been to see Tiger win tournaments again, my Uncle Bud passed away in the summer of 2013. 
I think it really broke his heart to see Wood slip out of the spotlight after spending over a decade watching his favorite player basically grow up. He would be proud and cracking open a root beer hearing the news last Saturday for sure, and definitely believe that people can turn around their careers and be changed people. After a spine fusion surgery and just like stints and rehabilitation, even Tiger says he doubted the, his ability to come back and play golf again. I'm looking forward to seeing him continue establishing himself as one of the greatest golfers of all time, and especially how his return will influence the spectatorship of televised events as well. I wonder if a lot of casual fans will be tuning back in next year in 2019. So that was a great story to come out of the sports world last week. I'll be back in a little while to preview a great story for the near future. But first, time to get back into some music. Here is Joywave with their song Tongues, here on 88.1 FM WVYC. You're listening to the Voice of your College. Welcome back to 88.1 FM WVYC. You're with me, Keel and Tollinger, in the studio for another half hour or so. I've got a quick question for you. When was the last time you heard of Dunkin' Donuts running a promotion on their donuts? Just let that sink in and think about it for a moment. The Mother's Day breakfasts at my house were often a dozen donuts from Dunkin' Donuts, of course. The peanut butter-filled Boston cream ones were the best they had. Pretty soon you won't be reminded they even have such a breakfast food on their menu because the company is trying out removing the second word from their name, beginning in January. This is to reflect the emphasis they'd like to put on their other items like iced coffees and breakfast sandwiches. It makes a little bit of sense considering society's trend to want to eat healthier meals, especially to start off the day, and also the fact that some adults don't eat breakfast at all. Of course, this riles up the masses, and the loyal customers are protesting in mass on social media, and this change doesn't take place. I don't even know where one is here in New York, and yet some of my classmates will keep coming in with these clear cups with the orange and pink letter D's on the logo. I can tell you one thing, that just making your logo a letter D is a bit of a long shot. But you know what else is a long shot? Penn State beating Ohio State this weekend. I love how I transitioned there. Yeah, so the primetime rivalry game that happens every college football season is coming together very early this year. So people around this region are gearing up for it. I don't think many of them know the name of the new running back, though, the guy who had to replace Saquon Barkley, now with the NFL. He's one of the talismans who's not going to be part of the Buckeyes' game plan to stop. But this Saturday night at 7.30 on ABC is the big one that decides much of the course of the season's remainder for both sides. It'll be decided under the lights of Beaver Stadium's 100,000 plus seats, no doubt fully packed, and all of them covered in white. If there's any place in college football with a home field advantage of that caliber, it's in Penn State. So what's the history at stake here? A pair of perfect records right now, for one thing. Penn State sits at number 9 and Ohio State at number 4 in the nation. Go back two years ago when they played in Beaver Stadium when the four unranked 4-2 four Nittany Lions upset the 6-0 and Buckeyes. Uh, with four and a half minutes left on the clock, Ohio State tried to extend their lead with a lengthy field goal, but that was turned around by a historic block at the line, then a 60-yard run back to bring Penn State up by three. It was an incredible achievement that not only gave the young head coach James Franklin his first signature win under Penn State, he hadn't beaten a top-10 team during his tenure, it paved the way for the Lions to become Big Ten Conference champions ahead of Ohio State. They would only make it to fifth place in the nation, behind Ohio State at fourth, which is a little weird that they couldn't go to the playoffs. Uh, Penn State went to the Rose Bowl and played a legendary high-scoring struggle against the University of Southern California, which was undoubtedly the greatest game of 2016, before they lost a nail-biter. In the Ohio State-Penn State rematch last year, this time Ohio in Ohio, the tables looked like they would be turned again when Saquon Barkley, the human cheat code, ran the opening kickoff 97 yards to open up a big lead in the first half. The only problem was that they could not hold on. The Buckeyes just understood how poor the pass coverage was on defense, and the quarterback in red was just flawless. In the dying seconds of the game, one go-ahead touchdown put the score at 39-38 in favor of Ohio, and the upset wasn't meant to be. So now the star running back is in the NFL, so is a skilled wide receiver in Chris Godwin, so is a towering tight end in Mike Gesicki. 
The one who remains is quarterback Trace McSorley, who I'd argue is the man to take control of a big primetime game like that. The Big Ten Championship, the Rose Bowl in 2016, the Fiesta Bowl in 2017, McSorley, or McSorley, basically flips a switch in his head to make big plays in big games. Now, with this being a senior year, he has one last chance to etch his number in the Penn State history books, but that'll be dependent on whether everyone else around him does their jobs. Most specifically, the offensive line in front, or else he will be running around and torn to shreds every play. Now, there are some big question marks to this Penn State team coming in. They're undefeated in ninth, but they don't ha like they haven't lived up to the expectations at all for this year. I mean, the opening game against itty bitty Appalachian State University, which was supposed to be uh, the event where they could kick around a smaller team and get settled in with a 70 point win, no, that went to overtime. I said it'd be like your college going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Philadelphia Eagles, if this school even had a football team. If you need until the midnight hour to beat a Cinderella team, that's kind of spelling danger for the future. There's been three games where they could shake off the dust and recalibrate, but this is the true test they're going to have when facing playoff locks like Ohio State. And while the Nittany Lions are different in composition compared to last year, I think it's an even more serious exam for James Franklin, because he has to prove he's a coach that can keep it together without talented players or assistants doing a majority of the work. I said the best running back in Penn State history is gone, the best wide receiver, the best tight end, but also the offensive coordinator who called those plays for those guys. Joe Moorhead is now a head coach at Mississippi State. That means new blood is trying to steer Mick Sorley through this imposing defense. But more importantly, I mean, they basically just like to fix this squad that let in a bunch of lower division players score 38 on them. They got to do that. And I'm someone of the opinion that James Franklin has been bailed out by more talented people in his five years so far at PSU. Now, part of that was having to deal with the sanctions from the Paterno scandal. I mean, there is no doubt that it took a lot of effort for Bill O'Brien before him and Franklin himself to piece together what they had for his first two years. But no doubt, he botched some things when trying to get quarterback Christian Hackenberg's head on straight and led the team to two consecutive seven and six seasons. When the likes of Barkley and McSorley could run wild on offense, the team could reap the benefits still being seen today. But now that he has a quarterback he's familiar with, and his protege is gone, and the team is young again. This is where we're going to have to see if James Franklin has got what it takes to lead Penn State into the national playoffs this time. I'll say one thing that it doesn't seem to be very smart to hang on to a coach forever, like that school did with to Paterno. If the fans or the school officials start to think that they're slipping back a step or two, decide that a five, six, or seven year span is enough, try somebody else. I'll give Franklin credit for putting Penn State back on the map, but it's a mistake I'd say to give him the reins indefinitely. The bigger question is, what is Urban Meyer still doing at Ohio State? That head coach was through a scandal of his own before the season began, where he didn't voice concerns about an assistant coach of his um, with accusations of domestic abuse against his wife. That inaction only led to a three-game suspension, and Meyer's come back just in time for the big game that matters the most in the season. It's a little mystifying to me that when word breaks of abuse nowadays in any form, the heads of schools haven't learned from the mismanagement that was with dealing with Sandusky and Paterno, that you can't linger on these types of claims and you should investigate and act immediately. Now, the previous Ohio State coach, Jim Tressel, was caught up in a scandal with his own players about trading sports memorabilia for tattoos, of all things. And when it was found he didn't get to the bottom of things by forwarding an email to the right people, that guy had to resign. Here Urban Meyer misses three games. At least he fired the assistant coach who was doing the spousal abuse. But despite him having some prior knowledge and not acting on it right away, he still remains in the squad. Uh, football shouldn't be this big of a deal outside of the field, but this is how it is when it's embedded in the veins of a country, when I'm the son of a Penn State engineer and have my collegiate team set for life. We'll see how the game fares on Saturday night. I could, it could be a complete and utter embarrassment for the fact that the Nittany Lions aren't prepared, or they could be in the conversation of winning a national championship if they just get over this one hurdle. I'll be back here in a few with some words on education 
after I play Youth Lagoon and his song July here on 88.1 FM WVYC. You're listening to the voice of your college. Welcome back to 88.1 FM WVYC, the voice of your college. That was Youth Lagoon with July. And I've got about 10 minutes left, so let's run through the last topic of the hour. So, there's all sorts of definitions you can categorize people into if you want to. They can help and hurt if you want to boil people down to groups like introverts and extroverts, even kind of juvenile ones like smart and stupid. And depending on who you ask, it's a bit like a 50-50 split on whether or not these conditions are what you're born with or formed later instead. Is biology, genetics a factor, or is it more psychological? Are you adjusted into these sorts of mindsets, sometimes without even knowing it, and you eventually wind up accepting it as part of yourself? Do you feel as if that outcome doesn't change, or can you work and make any modifications you want to happen? That's the question that behavioral scientists, psycholo- like psycholo- <laughs> yeah, you know, the psychology people, and educators like to know, particularly when it comes to how that measures things like personal opinions of oneself, their success, their motivations, and life goals later in their years. They started to coin the terms fixed mindset and growth mindset, maybe for the last two decades or so. The research seems to be fairly new. A fixed mindset sounds exactly like it might. It's your belief that some of your attributes and abilities are inherently fixed and unchanging. You were born with it, basically. What you feel like you can do and achieve, your whole outlook on the world, is essentially being formed out of this mindset. You may believe you're only as smart as your fixed amount of intelligence at birth can make you. Sometimes whatever you have is just enough. And while that might be good to have some concreteness in your life, you also might drift into the thought that there's not much else you need to pursue to further yourself. Worse than that, you might say that you can't go any farther in your knowledge and in your goals because you believe you're fixed. That level of potential you have is ultimately limiting you, turning you away from other things that are new territory. A quote from Maria Popova, who's a Bulgarian writer and critic, wrote this helpful way to break it down. A fixed mindset assumes that our character, intelligence, and creative ability are static givens, which we can't change in any meaningful way, and success is the affirmation of that inherent intelligence, an assessment of how those givens measure up against an equally fixed standard. Striving for success and avoiding failure at all costs become a way of maintaining that sense of being smart or skilled. So the gist of it is, why aim for anything more? Why come up against challenge and failure? If you're fixed on your current abilities, you'll often choose not to progress them. Now, the growth mindset is a little more optimistic. You accept that you have a basic, like, level of knowledge and things like your intellect, your skill, and your talent, but you acknowledge there's a capacity to increase them. You believe in a process of improvement. You get committed to furthering them. And through enough application, though it sounds a little cheesy, is that anything becomes possible. Whereas the fixed mindset shies away from challenge, a growth mindset throws itself at them again and again, imagining there's a slightly better person made each time. That helps your productivity everywhere from your business, your education, and your social life. It comes at the cost of maybe having to convince yourself and remind yourself of what you're capable of, and investing time and energy into difficult things, but your mind expands as a result. How, for instance, are we able to tell which of these two mindsets we're in? Researchers wanted to know if there's a way to cultivate these forward thinkers, understand their identity, find where this sort of mind-shaping starts. For a few decades now, I learned that one test some psychologists and sociologists have developed is a puzzle with blocks meant for children. There's about six of these cubes given to first and second graders in this one study. And each face of them has these colored triangles, like yellow in one half, and diagonally across is the color blue. They'd be given cards with pictures on them, and they'd rotate the blocks around to get their triangles to match the direction and the formation on the one with the picture, which is a pretty simple concept. And while these puzzles would start easily, like, progressively after three or four of them, there'd be tougher combinations. Um, like diamonds and trapezoids are the shape of a bird, And they got pretty tough. These researchers wanted to know not if the children could do them or not. It was more about how they faced the problem with these tougher puzzles. 
do they keep rotating blocks for maybe another five minutes or ten minutes trying to figure it out? Or after three minutes and a few attempts, they sort of shake their head, scoot back and say, I can't do it. That's what psychologists say is the earliest sign of whether or not a fixed or growth mindset is developing in people. And when kids want to keep trying or do keep trying, that diligence with something, like puzzles, can be applied to math, to friendships, to every facet of life. So the advice in the end for thinking in a more growth-oriented mindset is as simple as inserting one word into your inner thoughts. That's the word, yet. If you tack it onto something, say I claim I can't learn sign language, yet, that sets up a goal. It's not very clear, but it's out there. There's no timing to it, there's no buy in the phrase to set a constraint, but it just opens up that possibility for the future, and it's up to an individual to choose how they'll pursue that objective, hopefully with determination and without giving up. That's the power of the word yet. So that runs us to about 355. That'll just about do it for me in the studio for this week. After such a long week in college, I can't wait for this weekend to recharge a little bit, kick back and watch some Penn State football or something. Or if you're not that enthused with people running into each other, perhaps you can watch Tiger Woods in the Ryder Cup competition. Either way, thank you for tuning in, and uh, hope you can catch me next week from 3 to 4 p.m. here on WVYC on Fridays. Also, keep an eye and an ear out for a YouTube archive of my shows that I hope to launch for next week. I'll probably share some more details about where you can find that next time. Until then, my name is Keelan Tollinger, and I appreciate you joining me on WVYC. I'll leave things off with gorillas and humility. Have a good one, everybody.